Good afternoon, uh, a warm welcome to all of you, those who are in the room and then uh, online. And then I just would like to warmly welcome Professor Kunal Sen, Director UNU Vaidar, about whom uh, you will hear much more from my colleague, uh, Dr. Marchak. And then I also would like to warmly welcome Professor Nathkarni here, and then my all colleagues, senior colleagues, uh, students, and also the, uh, there are some, um, Members of Board of Governors, Professor Manoj Panda is there. A warm welcome to you, Professor Desh Pandey. And then um, thank you very much, sir, for being with us today. And then Professor uh, Nasima Reddy, and then uh, uh, Professor uh, Surya Narayana. I think uh, many, uh, many of your former colleagues are uh, there at IG area. So that's very good. And then uh, another, one, once again, uh, a warm welcome to all of you. And then uh, <clears throat> Uh, I'm very happy that um, a 10th Golden Jubilee Lecture will be develop, uh, delivered by Professor Kunal Sen on Is India a Land of Opportunity? And there is an interesting title. And then also the I have seen the um, slides and then uh, this is a very interesting topic on um, mobility, social mobility. And then we are uh, extremely fortunate to have you with us uh, physically. I know once we heard your lecture over online, and then uh, Professor Kunal Sen is here uh, with us for the last uh, one week or so now, and then he will be here for a few more days. In all, um, uh, as a week, carry we out uh, chair professor, and then uh, he has been spending uh, about uh, about uh, close to two weeks with us uh, uh, and the institute. So we are uh, very happy, and then he has participated in the student seminars, then this lecture, and then he will be giving one more lecture on 12th on um, uh, methodology, so basically impact analysis methods. I request all of you take, uh, to take good opportunity of this lecture. And then I, I saw uh, uh, some outline of his lecture, it's very interesting. And he's covering um, randomized control trials and then uh, natural experiments and also IV uh, methodology. And, um, uh, so this will be quite interesting for um, uh, both the uh, younger faculty members and also the students. So with these few words, and I would like to request uh, Dr. Machang to introduce uh, the, today's speaker. Over to you, Dr. Machang. Thank you, uh, Professor Rasika. Uh, it's an honor and I'm also delighted to introduce Professor Kunal Sen, who is uh, the Dr. VKR Virao, Chair Professor of our Institute, as well as Director of uh, United Nations University World Institute uh, for Development uh, Economics Research, uh, Finland. Um, Professor Kunal Sen has uh, over three decades of experience in academic and applied development economics research. He is a leading international expert on the political economy of growth and development. He has performed extensive research on the international finance, political economy, uh, determinants of inclusive growth, the dynamics of poverty, exclusive, social exclusion, female labor force participations, and the informal sector in development economies. His research focuses on R1, India, East Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Professor Sen has uh, authored eight books uh, and edited editor of five volumes of economics and political economy of development, which in the 
political economy of India's growth episode 2016, the process of financial liberalization in India 1997, the economic restructuring in East Asia and India, perspective on the uh, policy reform. His uh, uh, co editor of uh, deals and development, the political dynamics of growth episodes and the politics of inclusive development, and also written uh, 25 more chapters in other volumes and published more than 90 uh, peer reviewed journal articles in the areas of his research interests. He has, uh, he, he is the director from uh, uh, for uh, of the uh, uh, UNU wider from 2019, and he's a professor of development economics and global development institute, University of Man uh, Manchester. And in addition to that, he has worked as a professor of development economics uh, and the and the joint director, joint research director of the Effective uh, States and Inclusive Development Research Center and a research fellow at the Institute of uh, Labor Economics in, at, uh, in Bonn. He has also served in advisory roles with national government and bilateral and multilateral development, uh, development agencies, including uh, uh, DFID, ADB, IR, IDRC, International Development Research Center. And he's, he has been awarded the Sanjaya Lal Prize in 2006 and um, Dudley's Year's Prize in 2003 for his publications. I welcome Professor Sain to deliver this interesting uh, research, which uh, I mean, this, uh, I mean, topics on uh, East India, a land of opportunity. We look forward to listening to your insightful I mean, research. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction, and uh, and also it's a privilege to hold the Vikarvi Rao chair for the last couple of years because I have a very high regard for Dr. Vikarvi Rao. He's been the founder of many of India's leading higher education institutions, including ISEC, uh, IEG, and, and other institutions, and also the contribution he's made to national Group accounting, which was which was remarkable ahead of its time. Uh, and we, we have to understand how much. The contribution made a difference to India's understanding of our, our national income accounts, poverty, and so on over the years. Um, so it's, it's a really privilege to hold the chair. But also because I was when I when I was appointed the chair, I was very keen to visit ISEC. And then the pandemic came along and came in the way. I thought I'll visit in 2020. That didn't happen. I thought I'll be here in December 2021. That didn't happen either. So here I am. <laughs> so, and luckily this time I could make it. So it's really a pleasure, and it's also been wonderful hearing the PhD, final PhD uh, seminars, all of you morning, if you were presenting in the last few days, I really enjoyed it. And hopefully the topic I've chosen is something, I thought about the topic and I asked Dr. Shekhar, I, I, I took a topic which I know cuts across disciplines. In fact, uh, much of the work in this area has been done by sociologists, some by geographers, some by political scientists, and of course also economists. So it's a kind of topic which is very multidisciplinary, and that's why I deliberately chose this topic. I didn't choose a very economic topic. And I think this is a topic where, and, we, and I make this argument in a book that I just published, I'll, I'll mention afterwards, where we, we say that we have to have different disciplines working in this area. So the question I have there is India land of opportunity. And really just to start off this discussion, I mean, think about a child growing up in Karnataka, let's say a rural, rural uh, area in Karnataka. How do you think this child will be, be interested in reaching high income levels, occupational levels? education levels than the child's parents. It's gonna be higher than the child who are gonna be growing up in Bihar or Kerala or Bengal or any other part of India. And if it is higher, how do you explain this? What explains why we might see high mobility uh, in terms of occupation, income, education for a child growing up in rural Karnataka versus a child growing up in rural Bihar? And if there is not that, if it's not higher, what can the policymaker in Karnataka do to try and enhance social mobility? It's a fundamental question. This is really goes into what is called inequality opportunity. And it's, it's, profound, it's probably the most profound inequality to have. Because one can argue that you know, inequality outcomes is important. But what you don't really want is that 
two children living, living in different parts of India having different opportunity sets in terms of their own life chances. So the inequality of opportunity, many people will argue, is the most fundamental inequality that one can have. And of course, therefore, we should do something about it. We do see it. So you know, much of the work has been that has happened in the many years, over the many years, has been with the poverty line. And of course, that's important in India. Of course, we know measurement of poverty has been an important issue. And we have seen progress in, in lowering poverty in India and uh, elsewhere. But I think the point is that that's not enough. Just having somebody move over to the, below the poverty line, over the, over the poverty line, is not enough. And we really need to think about what else can we have this, this person do in terms of mobility upwards, income, education, occupation. And here the problem is, and something as I, I, I will mention it towards the end of my lecture, that the knowledge is, gap is huge. We don't really know much. We don't really know much because much of the work on this has been done on industrial countries, the West. So work on social mobility, there's an extensive literature on this. Sociologists, economists, political scientists, geographers, anthropologists have contributed. The knowledge gap on social mobility in a country like India is huge. We don't really know. The question I asked at the beginning, we don't really have a very clear answer. Um, so we need to think about what we can do with a research and policy, shifting the focus to low income or, or lower middle income class settings like India. And that's something that we, I've been arguing in many different contexts. But I want to specifically focus on India in this lecture. Now, why is social mobility important? I think it's fairly obvious, but just to be clear why it is important. Social mobility and define as ability to move from a lower to a high level education occupation or from a lower to a high social class or income group is a great hope of economic development. That's what you want. And for many, it should, be, well, it should also be one of the fundamental characters of a good society, of, of a socially ju just society. The people should be able to climb as, as high as they're able and not be hindered by because of gender, race, class, economic disadvantage. Right? So that's the whole point. Maybe some, somebody may not be able, but for those who are able, nothing should prevent where they, how far they can go. And that's exactly what social mobility is important. And that's why exactly why we should be interested in social mobility. Now, another reason is that there's a very famous, or you can seem to see this. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, this, the, this is a, the Great Gatsby curve. Uh, the Great Gatsby curve was, is very interesting because if you see the cross-sectional correlation between inequality and social mobility, social mobility measured in terms of education mobility, occupational mobility, and inequality measured in terms of Gini, there's a very strong correlation. If you can see this country, India is not in this scatter, because we didn't have we don't have data in, in India on this, but you see a very strong, strong fit. In other words, societies which have high inequality also have lower social mobility. This is why inequality and social mobility are intertwined. So if you have high inequality, that also means the children growing up in the societies are less able to move up, up to a higher occupation, education, so on. But this particular uh, scatter, this great Gatsby curve, is extremely robust. And in fact, this it tells us why inequality and social mobility have to be addressed together, right? Um, I'm not trying to make causal, causal claims here. Of course, one can say inequality leads to social mobility, lower social mobility, or lower social mobility leads to high inequality. That causal direction, we don't know, right? Um, so I want to speak a little bit about like a work I've already finished and published because I want to use it as a backdrop to what I'm going to be talking about more in the work in progress kind of way. The first question I'm going to ask is what do we know about social mobility in India the long during over many, many years? And then the question that where I'm still doing uh, current work is how do traditional institutions such as caste affect social mobility in Indian villages? This is work in progress, so I haven't talked about all the results, but I thought I'd just share with you what we have so far. Okay. So, you know, so, so one thing that I, when I started working on social mobility, I have to have now several papers in India. The first paper I published was EPW maybe about six years back. Um, I was still struck with the fact that we could only say something about parents and their children, fathers and sons. Uh, I should say that it's very difficult to work on mother-daughter mobility in India because you don't have data. That's something to think about for future PhD research, okay? Very difficult. I think maybe we have to think of how we can generate the data. So when I was looking at this, and I did this paper in EPW uh, with two of my colleagues who work on Vigar Ivers and Andrew Krishna, it was still looking at father-son mobility. And then I thought, why can't I think about three generations? And that had been done actually anywhere else in any other country context. Luckily, the Indian Human Development Survey, I found an answer, okay? And I'll tell you exactly how I did it because it was methodologically quite, quite difficult. So in this work that I, read, I did with uh, one of my PhD students, uh, we examined multi-generational mobility with three generations, right? 
um, using a national using the IHDS, which I'm pretty sure most of you know about, uh, containing which has information about education and occupation over three generations. This is unique because you don't really get that data sets anywhere else actually in the developing world, right? Um, now, why is that three generation important? Because imagine then if you're looking at a situation where you have a son, and I explain why I say son here later, son. Let's say son is over 21 years of age, so we are looking at occupation education. Somebody's already finished schooling and, and, and so on. And we're looking at the father. The son is 21, let's just say 21. Father may be 40, uh, 45, 50. The grandfather would be 75. So we're looking at over pretty much 30, 40 years of data, right? Pretty much almost post independence data. So when you have multi generational mobility, we can actually look at the long during historical data. And that's exactly why I felt I had to pursue this multi generational format. Uh, because of this, uh, seeing things happening over the last, since independence, really. Um, so that's why we, I looked at that. Now, one thing that, you know, uh, so this thing that looking at multinational mobility allows us to see the inequality of opportunity in India, how has it changed over time? Because you're now looking at a long, long uh, 40, 50 years of data, right? Um, and so, you know, in societies where there's dynastic transmission of wealth and social standing, intergenerational persistence of economic social status likely to occur, inhibiting significant social progress. So. Imagine that a uh, grandfather was a business person, very wealthy. Son is a, the son is also a business person, very wealthy. The grandson is also a business person, very wealthy. And this generational transmission of wealth carries on, right? That's not mobility. So just on the opposite side, the grandfather is agricultural laborer, very poor. Father is also agricultural laborer, very poor. And son is also agricultural laborer, very poor. And that persistence also stays over time. Right, they are persons at the higher end of the of income and wealth and occupation education, and we have persons in the world. Right, so that has to be broken because that is exactly the point. There's no reason why uh, the son of an agricultural laborer cannot hope to be a teacher or a doctor or engineer. Right, so that this is why this looking at it over many years allows us to see that how much is that happening in India? Is it being broken or not? Right, and that's what I'm going to try and look at during the first of the lecture. Oh, that's clear. You know, by the way, we can ask any questions, any questions in the, in, along the way because I like to, you know, I like to have more exchanges going on. Maybe some special questions you can keep to the end, but anything to clarification, do do interrupt me. Uh, okay. So this paper I published in Review of Income and Wealth this early this year with Anastu Kundu, who's one of my previous students. Uh, so I'm going to just talk about papers for something I, I finished, but I'm going to use that for work I'll be talking about later. So um, now. You might say, but you know, like, okay, so why did you choose education and occupation? Um, and the reason we did is because, first of all, in this IHG, this is the unique thing with IHG. There's a question asked in the IHGS survey, individual, the individual survey. What is the education of your father and the occupation of your father? And of course, the categories that you have to use, so you can categorize the data. Unfortunately, they don't ask the question, what is the education of your mother? And what is the occupation of the mother? Right away, you cannot therefore answer the mother-daughter question. So that's the big constraint. I hope that well, that might change, but we don't know as yet. Uh, uh, we have a good friend who works with IHS that uh, uh, who's been working on the third round. So I'm not sure whether this question will be asked, the mother question, which I think is very relevant now. So now people might say, why don't we look at income? And we are, have argued in the paper which we published in the World Bank Research Observer with regard to Vistad Anirudh Krishna. Income is not a good metric for a country like India. Why? Because first of all, there is this problem that we in this IG special, they don't, don't ask what income. They don't ask what is your father's income level, has been the father's income level. But more also in a country like India, especially with agriculture income, it's very, very volatile. So it's very difficult to know what permanent income is. And that's why we've been arguing that in the country like India or any society which has large agriculture population, income is not a good metric. While if you're in the US, of course, it is important, right? So we've been arguing we should not use income as much as we can when we look at mobility in India. Okay, so we look at education, occupation. Um, so we have this categories of occupation and education. Let me just explain them. They're quite obvious, but maybe not. So occupation, we have categorized into seven categories. Professionals, doctors, engineers, lawyers, clerical and uh, 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 clerical other occupations. Then we have farmers. Then this new, these two categories we introduced, this was, we did an EPW paper. We think it's an innovation because in most studies on occupation, we just have this uh, one category called vocational occupations. 
In India, there's a difference between higher status occupations, vocational occupation, and lower status vocational occupation linked to caste. So some kind of vocational occupations are caste driven occupations, and some are not. So you could be a, a technical worker that's not linked to caste, but you could be, for example, a barber, you could be linked to caste. So we felt that we had to differentiate these two categories because India, this is very important, right? So we have a higher status vocational occupation and we have lower status vocational occupation. And then the lowest level, as one would think, are agricultural workers and construction workers and anybody, any manual worker. So but the other categories are fairly clear and they've been used in the sociology literature. But this difference that we made in this higher and lower status, I have to say, was innovation. And now I'm seeing many papers in sociology using our classification. So that was something I, I liked that, that we made the difference on. Education is pretty obvious, literate less than primary, literate with less than primary, primary, pri middle, secondary, high secondary, or secondary. This was pretty much the standard way of looking at education. We could have um, clubbed together illiterate less than primary. Um, uh, and literally less than primary, but we felt still the illiterate category is got a important category. We get that separate. So that's a, that's education. And so now this is important, and this is for again mostly those who are doing PhDs here. Um, what we did is this this generation tree. The IHGS question, questionnaire asked the head of the household, "What's your father's occupation? What's your father's education?" The IHGS questionnaire also asked each member of the household their education and occupation. Right, so we can therefore take a family, take a family, we can find out the, the grandfather's education occupation, the head of the household is the son, the G2, the middle, and then we can find out the sons who are living in the family, and also the sons who are not living in the family. The best thing with IHG is that they did tracking of the non-resident children, or in fact, non-resident members of the family. So they tracked also those who left the household, because if it didn't include them, there's a selection bias. Right, maybe the more able children left the household. So we could include also non-resident siblings and resident siblings. But we could not, of course, we left out those uh, those uh, non-resident uh, sons because that information we don't have. We only have the head of the household and their and their parent. And we also left out the the the, the brother of the head of the household because that's also not important to us. So the generation is G1 is the grandfather, G2 is the head of the household, the son. And the G3 are the grand grandsons, either they live or living inside the house, inside the household, or those who have left. Okay, so hope that's clear. Any any doubts? Okay, right? Yeah, Kalaya. Yeah. What what about the daughter of the father? You don't track daughter of the daughter? No, I because thought you don't track mother, daughter, pairs, yeah. but father, daughter. Yeah, so that's a, you know, this is again a very important question. So first of all, of course, in the multi-generational format, we cannot do that, right? Because that question of the head of the household does not ask over the mother. You see, in the IHDS. But another point that's very important is that you see in India, married daughters do not stay in the family. They go out. And they go out of the usually out of the village. They move to some other part. There's this whole literature we know in marriage markets, right? So therefore, we don't know what happens to the daughter. The son often stays, in, especially in rural India, stay inside the same household, but the daughter, the, un, the unmarried daughter stays. But the married daughter is moving out of the household. So that's another problem with the mother-daughter mobility issue, which is probably why you know we haven't seen very much very much work for mother-daughter mobility, even in the West, right? Because of that problem. But it's more of a problem here, right, in the Indian context. So I hope that's clear. It's a, it's it's you know it's an interesting issue why why it's a real issue here. Okay. So then let's look at occupational mobility. Okay. G1 grandfather, G2 father, G3 grandson. Okay, uh, son, sorry, G2, son and G3's grandson. Now what's really striking there, you know, if you look at the lowest level, this is agricultural laborers, you can see huge stickiness. In other words, pretty much if I'm, if the grandfather's an agricultural laborer or a construction worker, because we also have construction workers in this category, then pretty much the son is more very likely to be an agricultural laborer or a construction worker and the grandson also. We're talking about three generations, right? You can see the green rectangle, it's so much constant over time, right? So that is frightening. I mean, right away you start thinking, my God, what's going on here? In most uh, societies in, in the West, there is this movement upwards. You know, you may have people who started out laborers or farmers, and then their sons became, you know, clerical work or something like that, and then maybe doctors, grandsons. That's been the case in the Western societies. Here in India, we don't see that, right? 
And we're talking about not just two generations, we're three generations, right? And then at the top, also you can see that category, the professionals and the clerical workers, there's also a lot of people moving down. In other words, it's quite possible that the grandfather was a doctor and the grandson was a laborer. That's also shocking, right? Because in Western societies, that very rarely happens. This big movement down. We're talking about the major movement down, right? Because you can imagine income level differences between a doctor and agriculture laborer. You can see that that also this movement down is quite remarkable. So very little movement up, thickness at the at the bottom, and quite some movement down. In the in the categories of vocational education, vocational occupation, there's a bit of movement up. You know, so somebody vocational education son might become a clerical worker, or maybe even a, a, a professional. So there we can see a more fluidity in that. In the middle, we see more fluidity. Not at the, at the bottom, no. And the top, we actually see downward mobility also, right? So that's also quite interesting. And education, of course, is very different. Education, we know that in India over the last uh, 40, 50 years, there's been a big expansion in schooling, right? So that we know that mobility has happened in India, you know? Uh, and you can see that the green rectangle there um, there, oops, sorry, let me press the right one. Yeah, here, you can, that's illiterate, right? G1 and G2, you can see, yes, there was still a big bunch of sons who were illiterate like the fathers. That decreases to G2, G3, fathers, uh, sons, and grandsons. And then we get to G1, G3, almost negligible. In other words, it's very unlikely when the grandfather was illiterate that you are still illiterate. That is the big thing here in India, right? Pretty much you're at least uh, uh, literate, maybe even higher level, the secondary and high secondary, or even post secondary, right? So that movement has happened like, across the board, right? So that's an encouraging sign. And on education, we see a big movement up. We can see these categories have really, look at this here. These are the two highest categories, uh, post secondary and secondary. Look at that here for the ones at the lowest level, and look at it here, big increase, right? And of course, at the top end, very few movement downwards. You know, if your grandfather is a higher secondary or post secondary, it's very unlikely that you're going to be literate, right? So that movement down hasn't happened in education, but has happened in occupation. So there is a difference in education and occupation, right? Okay. So this yeah. is across generations, sorry. Three, across yeah. Across so, generations, same year from same, the IHP, yeah, same yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly, same year. We are going back in time in right. the same way, yeah. Right. Yeah. But all the three generations at one single point in time. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then this is a graph that my student did was very like is the Sankey graphs, which are more popular in artificial intelligence and so on. And this graphs tell you like this in a very nice way what's happening like from generation to generation. So you can see this occupation. So let me again press it here. This is the agriculture laborers. This is G, the grandfather, father, son. What do we see? We see the agricultural laborers, very few moving up, very few moving up, right? You can see that some have made it up to the highest level, some to the next highest level, and a few here in the vocational side, but a big bunch of these people, their sons are still stuck in the same kind of occupation. And even worse, even here. Again, some movement up, but not much movement compared to the stickiness here, right? Now, what about this category, this green category? These are farmers. And the farmer thing is very interesting because a lot of them became agricultural laborers. So you can see this big movement down to being agricultural laborers. Now, of course, farmers are very different size, uh, you know, big farmers, small farmers, that we're not differentiating. But even the fact that even if you're a small farmer, your son doesn't end up being a farmer or anything else, your son ends up being agricultural laborer, it's pretty scary, right? Uh, and that is again, it's very interesting because this big movement down has happened in the grandfather, father generation, and also happening in the father's, uh, the uh, son or father, son, or this is son, grandson uh, generation too, right? And you can see the other kind of movements up are like almost negligible. You can see bits movements from vocational to upper and so on, very, very few. And the professional and the, and the clerical workers class, very few movements, well, some movements down, as you can see, but mostly stuck in that level. So the generic picture from this is that if you are unfortunate to have a situation that a grandfather was of a laborer, it's gonna be pretty likely that no matter what over generations that's gonna change, okay? Also, if you happen to have a grandfather who was a farmer, it's pretty likely that the son or the grandson will end up with a laborer. And then the other groups, 
uh, very unlikely that for the other groups, you're going to see movement back up to the being a professional or a career career. So that's the generic picture. Okay, what about cost? So education, uh, before I get to cost. So education, you know, that's pretty much, you know, expected, illiterate, uh, this is the illiterates, look at the big decrease in the size over time, almost, I mean, you look at amazing, here you see this book, almost majority, grandfathers, illiterate. Here, big chunk, but like 20 person maybe here in this group of, of the fathers, and the, then you get to the sons, the grandsons rather, the G3s, almost none, right? And of course, big movements all the way out to the highest levels. So movements up here, pretty, th pretty thick, pretty much happening, right? So education mobility, the story is very different. That that has happened in India, right? Uh, you could argue that you know there should be more movement up to the highest level. That has not happened so much, but nevertheless, the story is more, a bit more positive for education mobility. Okay. Now I want to. This is a bit difficult to read, so let me just show you by cause. But let me just point out. I mean just show things which I think are most relevant. This is by forward cast, upper cast, uh, OBCs, SC and S together, okay? The thing that's really, I mean, and this will come up in my, in the, in the, in the empirical results, quite surprising, and, or maybe not, is that for SCST, you can see this green rectangle here, right? Really little changes over time. While for the forward cast, even those who I got to label to begin with, or, or, or vocational, vocational occupations, there is much more movement. You can see the decrease in the green rectangle and upward movement in the upper categories. So across caste, OBC is somewhere in between. OBC is neither as bad as SCST in this often in the mobility side, but not as good as the upper thing. So it's a clear gradient here. Upper caste, even for those upper caste who are agricultural laborers or farmers or vocational occupation, it's very likely their sons are moved up, okay? OBC is less likely, but SC and ST are very unlikely, okay? And that's, you can see, and the thing I was quite struck by is how sticky this agriculture laborer occupation is among SC and ST, right? How sticky it is. And that tells you right away that question of is the India land opportunity, the answer right away, I would say is no, right? I mean, I think it's pretty even. So that's something, uh, you know, but I want to now just show you so education, I'll ask you this. Now, this is a regression from frameworks, and I know that some many of you are not economists. Let me just give you the intuition behind this. So what I wanted to, we wanted to do is to say, okay, we have this amazing data set where we can look at three generations. Can we now say something about what's happening to a Muslim grandson mobility versus a, a Dalit versus a tribal versus a OBC relative to the upper caste and relative to the grandfather's generation? So the double difference framework. So let me just be very clear, because this is really important. So what we're trying to say is that take the grandson of a Muslim family, compare the grandson's Muslim occupation of uh, occupation education relative to the grandson of a upper caste Hindu family, and relative to the, also what happened to the, grand, the grandfather in the same family. So has there been progress or not both over time, but also across other groups. So it's relative mobility. So we can do that because we have this three generation framework, right? And that's exactly why we have a double difference framework the, uh, approach, it's like a difference and difference for those of you who are interested in this. And we're just using this, this interaction with the social group and the generation to get this double difference uh, coefficient. And it's a very straightforward range. Okay, let me just tell you the findings. So basically, as we saw, mobility is increased over generation education, but not for occupation. Okay. But we also find stark differences across social groups with individuals belonging to socially disadvantaged communities lagging behind in social progress. That already we started seeing from the graph that we're going to see, but it comes out very clearly in the, in the regression. Okay. Multi generational mobility for Muslims in education and occupation has decreased, decreased, not even say the same, decreased in comparison to Hindus over the three generations. So this is quite a, quite a remarkable finding, right? Because if you think of what we are saying here, we're saying that a Muslim child uh, growing up in modern today's India actually has seen less of mobility compared to his, uh, his father and grandfather and compared to a Hindu child of, this, of the same age cohort. That's a frightening finding, right? So that's something that is, you know, we were quite surprised ourselves when we saw that because we had thought that mobility may not have 
gone up, but wouldn't have gone down over generations, right? So that's all, that's one finding. Another finding is that addiction mobility, we see positive signs. We already saw that in the descriptives that uh, scheduled cars, scheduled cars, and backward cars, there is an increase in addiction mobility, but we find no evidence of increase of addiction mobility for this group, for this group over the three generations. Again, looking back in time and across social groups. Okay. So in other words, what we're seeing is pretty much a murky picture of social mobility in India. A pretty murky picture, right? We're seeing pictures of where mobility in India has actually decreased for certain groups and has, uh, has decreased in both education and occupation. And that's a, education to me is quite remarkable because we had thought, we had seen education mobility has been increasing for everyone. That's not true. Not for the Muslim, uh, for Muslim families, but also, you're finding that for SC and SP, and uh, particularly, occupational mobility is also not increasing. And because we know that historically, especially Dalits are mostly active laborers, the fact that it has not changed over three generations is also a, not a very positive feature of mobility in India, right? So these are things that, you know, I think this is very mostly descriptive findings. But of course, then that leaves the question what's going on in India, right? I mean, why are we seeing this? And so that was why we thought about a follow up project. I'll talk a little bit about that. But let me just stop here and ask you, first of all, any clarification. I hope the results are pretty clear. But in, in case they're not, you can ask me now because I don't want to, you know, if people are confused now, I don't want to keep the confusion going on for the next 15 minutes. I just have a yeah. couple of clarificatory questions. First one is related to education. <clears throat> I know that uh, you have clearly shown that from illiter illiterate to literate, uh, this thing is happening. Do you have the information on? Uh, levels of education. So apart from uh, literate and illiterate, the school, um, high school education, school education, higher secondary, or yeah, that's that's because the, in the categorization, you have all of uh, all along, all, the, all along, there is any movement. Yeah, no. any movement, like there, either, is, no. yeah. there is improvement all over. Yeah, okay, yeah. that's what yeah. the uh, second. But uh, the, yeah, but of course, as I said that not for everybody. Not for yeah. okay, okay. That's what. And then this the data that we have used, how um, big it is and how representative. Uh, it's a nationally representative data set, mm -hmm. and they collect it across all the all well, pretty much all, all over India. And it is seen as you know they do very careful uh, uh, classified random sampling, and it is seen as pretty representative. Of course, they don't do every village in India, so this is not a national sample survey. But the good thing about the data is that they I um, think I've already been using the data. Yeah, that. Yeah. That you know, because there's a careful sampling going on, that is that is done uh, by uh, by the group who does it. People have a lot of faith in this data. You know, this is probably now the only data set we have, which is uh, given what's happening with the National Sample Survey, yeah. which is the most reliable data we have, especially because there's a new round going on, which is being led by Professor Amari yeah. Dubey. Sure. Uh, you know, but yeah, and uh, the reason why I'm asking is that this uh, this finding relating to Muslims is really shocking. That uh, this one. So the, there is some kind of uh, <clears throat> ghettoization that takes place. Now, most of the Muslims are getting concentrated in urban uh, India. So therefore, I'm asking this question relating to uh, sample. So what is it? Wants to ask. Yeah, uh, uh, Professor Deshpande, please go ahead and then ask some question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, this yeah. is uh, uh, not exactly a question. Am I audible? Very well. OK. Now, uh, in the, I, I'm I'm little bit diverting only to give a uh, parallel. When we deal with the national accounts data, we make it uh, in real terms. We deflate it with the national account deflator, right? Mm -hmm. So that's only to remind one thing: that over generation, the culture also changes, and culture is a deflator, because my great grandfather wanted his son to be a teacher. My grandfather wanted his son to be a teacher. And my father wanted his son to be a teacher. And it continues. This is something, a culture set inside. And therefore, even in politics, even in politics, there are five, six generations which are going on in the same house without doing anything, which we know all. Now, unless we deflate, the occupational mobility with the culture of the household, and that is not caught in the data. It has to be uh, uh, qualitative. The second thing which I felt that, uh, yes, 
farmers turning to agriculture laborers is one of the things which we felt very much. In fact, between 91, that is after the economic reforms, and till 2011, 50 lakh cultivators from the census data, from the population census data, 50 lakh cultivators have recorded that there are no more cultivators. And 146 lakh agriculture laborers or the laborers have said that they are agriculture laborers, which is a huge increase over 91. Why did this happen? This happened, one, because the uh, development pattern in the Indian context is totally different. A third issue is as far as Muslim mobility is concerned, I have seen it very closely. Usually the skill jobs are preferred by Muslims and therefore they would like to stay in the same garage which the father was owning or the kind of mechanical uh, shop which the father was owning. So the mobility is less. The mobility is more with the people who have mobility inside them, in the sense they have moved from their ancestral house to a taluk place, to a district place, and thus they show mobility. Incidentally, they belong to the uh, group, which is middle class group. And therefore, it is, it is natural that the mobility differences, but then one has to, if not, one has to at least mention in a footnote, why does this happen? It does not happen just because there is no chance, but it happens because of the culture of immobility. Thank you. It was very interesting and I'm listening. I'm listening. You may not thank, be able to thank see Thank you me. very much, uh, Professor Deshpande. And thank then you. I have four more, uh, four interventions. Vani, Professor Madheshwaran, and Professor Kala, and Dr. Indrajit in that see. order. And then there are two more. Three more actually, yeah. so altogether, the, but this is, lecture, so this is only interval, this is only interval, and then uh, this is only half, uh, half of the his lecture, and then remaining half of the lecture is yet to be delivered. So would you like to wait until then or uh, uh, complete it? I think uh, it's better to better that you complete it, and then... Uh, oh yeah, uh, the, yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Please complete. Okay, let Please me just uh, keep on, your questions. Yeah. Uh, back of your mind or you write it down yeah please yeah sorry to you know but so, so i don't want to us to cross uh, uh, the allocated five o'clock being the end, end point of this lecture so let me carry on so what in this now so the second part of my, this thing is it kind of goes back to Professor Kleshpande's question about so as i was saying what i've shown is a descriptive find descriptive findings right i didn't say and i was very careful not to say not causing so we're not saying what causes this movie because that's a different question right and that of course needs much more work on causal Inquiry, causal, causal questions. So here we're trying to get a little bit towards the causes, but in a very specific way, because otherwise there are lots of different things that happen at the same time, right? Association with the culture and so on. So here we're trying to see that, and this is only for village in rural India. We're looking at village structure, village social structure. So the question we're going to ask in this particular uh, part of the lecture is: Does it matter whether the village that you live in in India is dominated by own social group or come or is a, where situations are under the social group dominates it, in particular the upper caste. So does it matter for a Dalit child if the Dalit child is being brought up in a village where the dominant social group is the Dalit or the Dalits versus a situation where the Dalit child is brought up in the village, the dominant social group or the upper caste, okay? And again, the IHDA's question is very good because in the village question, they asked about social groups, land ownership and so on. We can actually look at land ownership of social group is in the IHDA's village question. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Right, so and this paper is still going, uh, they haven't finished writing it. This is Vega Devison, who I've read a lot of papers on social mobility with, and also Kundu, my PhD student, Rahul Lahuti, who some of you might know here, who's been at this Penn University, and, uh, and, uh, and Master's of four of us. And the paper I've been thinking of calling the Barrio or Catalyst Traditional Institution on Social Mobility in Rural India. So this is work in progress, we haven't got the final results as yet. Okay, motivation. Now, just again, just because I know some of you are st students here. So in the social mobility literature, in economics, the most influential work has been done by somebody called Gary Becker, who won a Nobel Prize and, and one of a quarter called Thomas. And there the argument they made is that basically mobility happens when parents invest in the child. The parents invest schooling, they put the child in a good school and so on. And of course, the, that is a function of parental endowment, income and wealth and so on, right? And in that kind of framework, there's no other important factor. It's all, all about parental endowments, parental investment, 
at the human capital story. And if you remember, Gary Baker's work has been written like that, right? So that's a very limiting story, especially for continuing India, right? There's many other things going on. And even in, for the US, Raj Chetty and others, so Chetty has been the most influential uh, academic working in this area of activism and economics, has even there defined in the US, there's a lot of variation on mobility across the US, and they find that high mobility areas tend to have less residential segregation, less income inequality, better primary schools, greater social capital, and more stable families. Even in the US, some of those factors we can resonate with us because they say in India, these things also matter, right? So therefore, we can expect in India, neighborhood and spatial variation to be particularly pronounced across rural areas of India. Things like essential segregation, things like better uh, schooling, schooling, and so on, will be obviously more pronounced, the variation is more pronounced in India. Now, we know that if you think about uh, any particular village in India, there are lots of things happening. We have parents who are not, illiter are not literate, they're low quality schools, they have credit constraints, parents cannot borrow to finance education of the children, uh, lack of support influence in, in one's neighborhood, non availability of sources of information and guidance about called carrier pathways, many things are happening. These are multiple and all interlocking, right? So it's very difficult to say which ones are more important in this kind of context. So what we're gonna see is we're gonna to try to look at village caste composition, or social, village social group composition. You see, that's an important factor a lot, okay? So we're just honing onto one set of factors here, not everything, just to be clear again, because it's very difficult to look at everything. And what we're gonna look at is something that Hopefully, it's of interest to uh, sociologists and non, uh, other or non economists. We're looking at what we call the enclave effect and the proximity advantage or op operation disadvantage effect. The proximity advantage of uh, uh, operation disadvantage effect comes a lot from Srinivas's MS Nivas's work on theory of cost dominance. And the enclave effect is argument that economists are making that if you're living in a village which is dominated by your own social group, it might actually be a good thing, but it also could be a bad thing. And we'll see why it could be a good thing or a bad thing. While if you're living in a village from the upper caste, again, it could be a bad thing, or it also could be a good thing. Okay, we're gonna try and think about that. So un enclave effect is when you stay in a village dominated by your own social group, proximity advantage or operation disadvantage is when you're staying in a village dominated by the upper caste. Yeah, is that clear, pretty clear? Okay, right. So this way I'll be able to read this table. What I wanna just put then, just gonna tell you a little bit about our thinking on this. So enclave effect, if you think of why does it matter if I'm living in a village which is some Dalit child, why should it matter if the social group dominated the village is Dalit? Well, there are good things about that. What are the good things about that, right? The good things about that is that my social group controls schools. My social group, group can make sure this child can go to a school, can get, you know, get educated and so on. So less discrimination in the school, right? Also, I may have political power. So my social group might be winning panchayat elections, maybe be having an MLA, and that MLA or those or the panchayat leaders can do something for my village. So therefore, there is both this question of less discrimination in schools, less discrimination in labor markets, and better occupational mobility, but also more political power. So that's one positive side of having a village dominated by your own social group, whether it's a Dalit, whether it's OBC, whether it's a ST, or whether it's a Muslim. Right? The negative side is, of course, and we know this, that those kind of villages are disadvantaged in, in public goods, in rich public goods. The disadvantage in terms of village infrastructure. Often those villages are located in poor agricultural zones. They tend to be having bad land quality because, of course, upper caste village, upper caste go for areas which are more favorable for them, right? So therefore, the village that you're living in, there's a good thing about being in a village where you're dominant, your group is dominant, but there's a bad thing being in that village because you may be deprived of very important public goods, roads, and things like that, or maybe living in a situation where the land quality is very poor. So you can see the argument, right? That the good things about being in a village dominated by your group, but there are bad things too, right? So I'm just sort of, you know, just very quickly in this on that. On the on the approximate advantage, uh, approximate uh, effect uh, advantage, again the same story, right? Sometimes people might think that. Why do you want to stay? Why would a Dalit child living in a village from the upper caste be a good, can it, how can it be a good thing? Well, if that village has better public, better schools, if that village has better roads, better infrastructure, then it can be a good thing, right? So there is this other side that living in a village covered by the upper caste, even if you're a different social group, you might benefit from the public goods that are being there in that village, as we mean the public goods are available, 
right? And also it may be they better teachers in the schools, better school quality, school, schooling quality. So that's the positive side of being in a village that is not the upper class. But there are negative sides. Also on the negative sides are pretty obvious, more discrimination. As we know, we have lots of very good papers on this. We have seen that Dalit children in, in schools which have upper caste children also, upper caste teachers, are the ones who are very marginalized at the back of the classroom, hardly get any, any, kind, of, uh, any kind of education. So there are obviously real big issues about discrimination in these villages, right? And often these villages are also, and those you probably know this, uh, and the ISGS actually has this information, you often live in one part of the village, the Dalit, and you have schools in that part of the village for you. I've been in fact in Karnataka, I've to some of the schools and the village and seen that. And some other part of the village, upper caste, living in the more favorable area of the, of the village, the land quality is better, also have their own schools. So in, the, in a situation like that, you have very strong segregation, right? IHG has asked the question, do caste groups stay together on their se on separate mohallas? So this again is a very important question that how segregated is the village? What is this kind of special uh, the division of the village in terms of who gets access to schooling, public goods, and so on? So, so there's a clear negative side of this too. So again, empirically not obvious what it is, right? So just that's, hope that's clear. Now, um, I wanted to show you this maps, and I'm going, going to be very careful about these maps. So this is constructed from the IHGS data. The IHGS data, this data does not, does not uh, have data for every village in India. It's a nationally representative sample, but it doesn't interview everybody in every village in India. And therefore, what we do is, and we are not told which village it is. IHGS does not reveal the, the name of the village because they don't want people to go to the village and do their own kind of surveys. So we do not know which village base is. We know which district they are. So what we did here is we, we aggregated up to district level. That has a huge problem. So I'm going to say that these graphs are not literally maps of, of mobility in India because this is to conserve IHGS data. What we really need is census data or something like that to do that. And that's a different, you know, that's a different thing that we haven't done here. But even here, what is interesting is that you can see this is like, you can see this is father's education here. And there are particular parts of India, which I was a bit surprised. And that's why I'm not completely, I feel like some of this data is not reliable at the district level. You can see high move, higher levels of education of fathers in the Northern Indian states, some of the Southern states here also, like here in this part of, uh, of here, just probably Karnataka is in here, and then from Kerala, Kerala also out here. And then you can see, given the father's education, what happens to the son's education, and generally, this these are colors are telling us there's upward mobility. The, the, if you had yellows here, there would be lower downward mobility. Generally, we see very kind of fine examples of downward mobility. Generally, we see upward mobility so in some areas more, some other areas less. So that's education. That's what we already saw in the earlier graphs, right? Occupation is a bit different, and already we've seen that. Occupation, the higher, the more deeper colors are fathers with higher occupation, like clerical workers and, and professionals and lower colors are agricultural laborers and vocational occupations. Again, we see a big difference. And again, I'm a little bit surprised that we seem to see high occupation levels in the Northern India part. This is why I still think this is not really totally reliable, this data at the, at the district level. And, but you can see the greens are telling us by and large there's been downward mobility because green is like minus one and so on. So one level down by and large, right? So you can see that pretty much across the country. So education move, movement generally across the country up, uh, occupation generally, not everywhere, moving down. Okay, so this is just to give you a sense of the, the, the spatial nature of mobility with the big caveat that this data is not really represented at district level. Okay, so somebody can try and do it at different level. Okay, okay. and land dominance, um, this one is where, who dominates the village? And this one made sense to me. So if you see, if you see this here, OBCs, you can see OBC land dominance and land, land dominance in many villages pretty much across India, right? Dominance in the middle part of India, Northern India, Southern India. And that's quite intuitive. OBC, OBC is spread across India. And in some villages, they might be dominant. That means they own most of the land. In some other villages, they may not be dominant. So this is intuitive life. Well, okay, that I, I think makes sense to me. And you can see like ST here, as you, uh, sorry, SC here, I see here very little evidence of mobility generally, um, mostly, you know, of some, but not a lot. So SC, sorry, more mobility, land dominance, and a few, you know, here and there. But ST, you can see, as we expect, they are mostly dominant in the eastern part of India. So there, in fact, often, they are the 
only social group in the village. Sometimes a few others, but mostly the other ones. So that makes sense. Eastern part of India, the dominance of SDs on land and land is something you see, and a few others in as well. Okay. And upper caste um, is that's uh, that Muslims, again, Muslims, you see a few here and there. And upper caste, of course, as you expect, much more there is a dominance. Many, many villages are dominant by upper caste. And you can see it again across India. Okay. Um, so that's you know telling us there is quite a bit of variation going on on dominance across the country, and you know and that itself tells us that we have to obviously by looking at the distribution across the country we can say something about it right on more villages. Okay, now this is also interesting. Um, this is a, a graph we put together where we have land dominance on the vertical axis and population dominance on the, on the horizontal axis. What it is telling us that in villages which have obesity are the most numerically the highest. They also dominate the land. So the more obese in a village, they also own the land. Okay, and you can see, except for a small proportion of villages which have upper caste land dominance. Look at SCs; totally different. In SCs, even though you may dominate the village numerically, the highest proportion of those in the population are from SCs. You do not seem to dominate the village because of land. You can see that red is the dominance by land. But many of the villages in this group, in this group, upper caste are dominating or obese are dominating. So they are so basically what it's saying is that a big chunk of villages in India where the S is dominate in population, they do not dominate in land ownership. Okay. Um, this is the ST, and you can see, as you expect, major generally where they dominate by land, uh, the population, they dominate land. Because of the fact they are tend to be in one part, most important part of the right? And Muslims also, same story. Very few dominance by upper caste or with and so on. But upper caste, you can see, wherever they are numerically larger, they dominate land ownership. Because you can hardly see, except a little bit in the OVC here, most of it dominated by both population dominance, but also land dominance. I hope this one is clear, because this is really telling us a lot of variation across this dominated, you know, and the dominance theory, what we did is that we gave a value one if the proportion of land owned by, say, SC is the highest. So suppose SC is owned 30, 40 percent, uh, other group owned 30, 30, 30, whatever, then we give the value one to say dominance by that group. Okay, so it's a bit crude, but just to, you know, we can use more continuous measures, but just to give a sense that what is dominance here. Okay, right? No, okay, let me move on. To uh, okay, now let me just okay. This is a, a very difficult equation <laughs> to understand. What I, we are trying to do is that you know, so we have the mobility left hand side of a Jewish occupation, and we want to see does it really matter whether you live in a village dominated by your own group or by a but upper class? So, this is just a regression of scattering, right? So, that's all you got to think about. Okay, very simple. So, what do we find, right? So what we find, it's again very interesting because so here, let's just look at education to start with um, here. OBC, SC, ST, Muslims and upper, right? And one is up, uh, the, the triangle is upper at mobility and, and one across is lower. I will, let's, you know, lower, lower has been going down. Okay, let's look at upper. OBCs, it doesn't really matter whether OBCs dominate the land or not of the land. Occupation, uh, education mobility is pretty much the same. So OBC, it, the, the, that already we've seen in a pre, the previous slides I showed you doesn't seem to make a difference whether OBCs dominate or not dominate. Okay, SCs where they dominate, we can see some benefit of moving up, right? That this is that one is means they're dominating the village, zero is they're not dominating. So it's movement of moving up, moving, moving up. ST just opposite. Where they dominate, they move down. They are, the upper mode is much less, right? Muslims, again, same story, where they dominate, they are mobility, education only, much less, upward mobility, much less. And upper, of course, by the dominant, as we might expect, they are doing much better, okay? Occupation, again, just look at the triangles, OBC, no, really no difference at all. S, SC, again, better off in their own villages, on their own villages. STs, again, worse off in their own villages. Muslims again, but now this is interesting. In their own orbits here, they see, we see higher mobility, and that's different education here. And upper again, where they dominate, they also better off. Okay, so we're getting kind of you know interesting story, quite varied across the different social groups, at about education occupation. 
but it is telling us something is happening in this two proximity and clave effect, right? Something's happening there. And, uh, and just to sort of summarize, I just present the main findings. Um, so what we then we did the regressions and we find that the enclave effect, so where we see SCs essentially uh, dominating their own the village, we do see higher mobility, both with the grandfather father, because we can do it across the three, uh, the three generations and also the, uh, for the grandfather father and negative for Muslims, so both grandfather father and father son. So just to give you a sense what you're trying to say, we're saying that the enclave effect is positive for Dalits, for, edu for, uh, uh, for education and also for occupation, but negative for Muslims for both education and uh, for, for education or occupation. So the enclave effect has some positive, uh, positive values for Dalits, uh, for Dalit households in the villages they dominate, both for education and occupation, but just opposite for Muslims. Okay, so again, I'm, you know, this I think we need to do more work on. This is interesting findings. Proximity advantage, interestingly, even there, S is benefit. The S is benefit both in villages which they dominate, but they also benefit from villages which the upper caste also dominate. And that again is quite interesting, both the education occupation for the general generation prayers. And so that's something that is telling us that for the Dalits, there's a ton kind of different things going on which we need to understand. So far, we haven't tried to understand exactly what is driving this, because we need to go in and look at the mechanics, right? One possible hypothesis for us is village infrastructure for proximity effects. And why is that? And, and the other possible uh, uh, issue could be mechanics could be political power. Because we know that it's where they dominated their in terms of their own in the village, usually they would dominate the panchayat, but possibly also the higher level. The political power could also be important for the enclave effect in positive for SCs, right? Now, village infrastructure, interestingly enough, so here's a table from IHGS, we can see that Muslims and SCs do far worse, or in fact, actually, most of the groups that upper caste come to villages. If you look at this, right? Uh, here, look at this. Uh, let me just take one of the indicators here. Okay, so no bus stop. 60% of the villages which are most mostly dominated have no bus stop, compared to 35% upper caste. Accessibility by road. 80% of the Muslim dominated villages are accessible by road compared to 90% of upper caste. In fact, pretty much every indicator here, every indicator here, all these all these groups are disadvantaged versus upper caste villages. Upper caste of every indicator here. You know, you can see, I mean, some of the indicators like electricity and so on. So that's quite remarkable, you know, that we seem to see, either by design or by chance, very different public goods provision across villages which are dominated by different social groups. And land, land, yeah, land. Because population is a bit misleading. Land is catching social power, right? You know, the proxy for social power. So yeah, that's important to yeah. So that's interesting that that can explain to in our view quite a large extent why if you are a Dalit or SC or, OB or Muslim staying in a village dominated by your social group, you're worse off because you have less access to public goods, less flexible infrastructure, right? And that's an interesting thing about whatever you can think of the policy, the policy solution be that. Why hasn't there been equalization of village infrastructure across villages, right? If that's an important mechanism for mobility, which it is, right? Of course, things like uh, you know having uh, access to roads and so on are important for population mobility, right? So right away you can see there's a clear policy implication might come out of this, right? So anyway, let me just finish because I think I'm pretty much now running out of time. Um, that so you know just this is a very generic kind of uh, uh, finding. I mean conclusions. So one thing that I've, I've been trying to argue now for several years that we should think of investing in social mobility. We think of investing in growth, we think of investing in property production. We should think of investing in social mobility, right? Thinking through policy investments that can really target social mobility, right? Um, and there are many things we can think about in that, in that area. And there is has been this view, you know, that, you know, economic growth will happen, people will get poorer and it's all gonna be all fine, but we should think about an alternate model of action that just turns around and says that, no, we should try to promote social mobility so that the poorer people or people who are in social groups can do better, build themselves upward, and that will lead to economic growth, interest economic growth. So we should turn the model around and think about starting at that end and then thinking that growth is just, just as a function of that, right? 
So that's something that I think we should be thinking more about, which I don't think has happened in India. And also, you know, the point here is that this work I showed you earlier, that in spite of economic growth, in spite of our protection programs, we are finding here quite clearly the evidence being that some groups that are worse, not even the same as the upper caste over time. And that's something we have to think what, what's going on on chain. Of course, uh, the Shwanda mentioned a few factors, but of course, many other things too, right? What can we do about that? And just to end that, you know, uh, and so what, finally, growth and social justice have to be promoted together by making social mobility. You can't think of growth as one thing and, you know, and social justice, and you have to think about them, about both. The social mobility brings together these two things. Right? That's the one thing I like about this, about this conference. I just want to say that we have a book that has come out, Open Access, called Social Mobility in Developing Countries, Concepts, Methods, and Determinants. Uh, open Access with Anirudh and Vegard being the co-editors. And uh, um, I think there is a, even a CPR on very soon, which I can send to you now, where we talk about the book, Center for Policy Research, online, so it's going to be hi, uh, hybrid. But the thing there, you know, in this book, we try to make the argument that we should so take social mobility research seriously. It really matters. And so what we do in this book is that we have chapters on concepts of mobility, methods of mobility, and then we bring together anthropologists, economists, historians, political scientists to have this conversation in, across the discipline to say how each discipline would approach social mobility. So for example, Vivian Wright is in JNU, a very nice chapter on uh, how an anthropologist will look at mobility. We have Himangshu, who uses who's in JNU also, who looks at the Palanpur survey to see how Palanpur, the, this long survey we have in Palanpur in, in, in Uttar Pradesh can, can help us understand mobility. So I think this thing of looking at different disciplines is very important in this work. So I just want to end by saying that, you know, this is why ISEC is important. You know, we have to bring different disciplines together. It's not just the domain of economists or sociologists. So anyway, let me finish here. Thank you. So, yeah, uh, excellent lecture. And then, um, although one could, uh, um, summarize, I don't want to summarize right now because uh, I think most of you have already gotten the summary, therefore uh, there are already some questions. I already have uh, seven uh, people in, uh, in my list and eight also, and I will uh, invite uh, all of you in that order and kindly be brief and then pointed in your uh, uh, in intervention so that uh, we can accommodate more uh, uh, this thing. So, uh, Vani, Professor Mazeshwaran, uh, Kala, Indrajit, Bala, Anil, and Gitu, in the first round. And then uh, Chandan and uh, uh, Matsan. Okay, you, you can come in the second round. Mm -hmm. So, first, uh, yeah, Professor Nathan, you also. <laughs> yeah. So, please uh, go ahead, Vani. Uh, so, thank you, Professor Kunal. It was a very interesting lecture. So, my uh, one small clarification that I have is, you know, um, how, how do you control for the age? So, for example, um, say um, you are into, I mean, the respondent is about 55 years. Okay. So, when you ask his father's occupation or education, he would be, say, about 75 years, and his son will be about 25, who has already completed the education. Fine. So, but on the other hand, if the respondent is only 35 years, then his son would be just five years or six, seven, maximum 10, something like that. So where will be still study? And if you are looking at the education part of it, then you can't see actually the mobility because he hasn't completed his education. Uh, on the other hand, his father will be 75, uh, about say 55 years. Who is, I mean, like, you know, we are in a completely different generation where, you know, the father being 55 is still, you know, uh, progressed uh, age group and he would have studied and things like that. So, how do you control for this age part of it? That is what was my small question. Professor Kunal, you. would you like to take all the questions and then answer, or how? Yeah, I mean, how many questions are we? No, right now, first one is the eight uh, interventions, and afterwards, two more are there, and a few are here. Right, I think eight together would be four. four. Okay, yeah. then uh, Professor Madhesh. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rajasekhar. Uh, Kunal, indeed, it's a uh, wonderful lecture, a long time in this hall I'm hearing. And of course, uh, this topic is very close to my heart and as well as I've been working on inequality and discrimination for a long time. Uh, you started with uh, the inequality of opportunity. And uh, I looked at the Gatsby curve of your 
inequality of opportunity and the whole lot of results. And what I have a, a, a kind of a categorization uh, which I have given to one of my PhD thesis. It's quite unfortunate she has presented on 30th. She should have presented on first so that she would have got the very good uh, the comments. The categorization basically, of course, you are right, uh, because any policymaker, when they talk about the inequality, it is not necessarily the inequality of outcome, the inequality of opportunity, these two are same side of, I mean, two sides of the same coin when you talk about policymaking. Of course, it's well done, result and everything. But the thing is that uh, 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 when you look at the factors for this inequality of opportunity, when I talk about this, and I just would like to categorize is that this is because of the resource inequality you have given here and the capability inequality, which are shown education and as well as health. And also there is an existential inequality. Somehow you had given some proxy here. So from your, from your findings, I just uh, 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 wanted to uh, put it as resource inequality, capability inequality, and the existential inequality. That's what coming out very seriously from your findings. While saying that, uh, my question is here. So how do we link these three and to talk about the social mobility. That's my first question. My second question, very importantly, I'm being a human capital economist, gathered by Professor Natalagoun way back. Uh, he's the first man to write the rates of return to education in India in 1963, in Journal of Human Resources. And uh, uh, well done that you, you, have, you have mentioned the Gary Beckers and Tom's model of intergenerational mobility and later on, they said that rotten kid theorem, of course, you must have read that. And uh, in which that, in that tradition, there is a Topman and Worlds, they were trying to say uh, the occupational, uh, the transition probability matrix. But here, uh, in a way, uh, sometimes the transition probability matrix whether you take an education or occupation, because this highest DS data is longitudinal that I know, because I was part of a second wave of highest DS data collected by my own supervision. Uh, 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 so that I know the quality of the data. But what my question here is that, uh, as Bonnie was saying, when we work on this transition probability matrix, uh, see it's very well says that the age is a matter. I think, how do we solve that here? So that's my uh, second question. I have third question because there are many people are there. So I will talk to you in person. So these are my very two major uh, question, uh, which I would like to thank you. Uh, put thank it you. Yeah. In, a, in a nutshell. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kunalsan. That was an excellent lecture. Um, I just have a mixture of uh, very quick clarificatory questions and one or two substantive questions. Uh, clarificatory questions, what wave of the IHPS, what year, and uh, what was the highest level of education in the wavy uh, uh, graph that you uh, showed us? Uh, uh, those are, and uh, the other clarificatory question is whether you took uh, rural areas only and IHPS does not really look at cities or residents or households there. Uh, clarificatory question. Now, two, three, uh -huh. and one other clarificatory question, similar to what Vani asked. Uh, when you look, when you are saying mobility, uh, is it monotonic mobility, like in the sense of uh, grandfather, father, son, like for example, from doctor to agricultural laborer to engineer? How would you say that? Is it downward or upward? Or I, I don't know that. That's a clarificatory thing. Now, how do you handle mixed marriages? Because you said OBC, Muslim, SC, SC, upper caste. So if the father got married to a SC, and then would you classify that under the dominant caste of the father? Obviously, I think, because women are not really in the picture at all here, right? Okay. Uh, the only one substantive question I have here is, I do know this uh, thing is not nationally representative, 
but are there any regional variations based on your preliminary research or because the reason why i ask is that in our 2015 book on the paradox of india's north south divide what we found was that in tamil nadu for example 90 88% of the population was basically obc or the, the lower caste and their affirmative action was whereas in up majority of the population was upper caste and affirmative action even if it was advertised the poor, those posts were not filled so how do you re i think i strongly suspect there will be some regional variation to what you are finding here thanks a lot thank you uh, and uh, just, last just, one okay just to, one second so i forgot to say that you know it's a it's a wonderful result but the thing is that uh, the kind of a paper which comes from journal of human resources like father like son so that kind of a concept is not coming up in india so uh, in a way that why that's okay that's yeah. another important question thanks uh, indrajit can you please unmute and then ask your question kindly be very brief indrajit yeah one second one second you will be allowed to speak yeah now yes. go ahead thank you. yes i was trying to unmute myself <laughs> no yeah. thank you very much sir for enlightening us with yet another interesting and uh, analytically rich um, uh, 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 paper sir i have uh, two clarificatory questions the first thing is uh, you said this uh, this educational mobility is happening but not the occupational mobility but why educational mobility is not able to create occupational mobility is it because of the quality of education or something else and uh, the sir uh, the second thing is uh, uh, you have six uh, classifications of jobs but how do you rank them is it based on the average earnings or you have some guidelines in the literature and uh, one related questions once you see this upward mobility it's okay i am okay with it that people uh, do have aspire to uh, the, the go ahead with this upward mobility but a smaller section you can show even the downward mobility as well so what is the reason for that downward mobility thank you very much i think i should try to answer for now so uh, thank, first, uh, thanks first, thanks first to Professor Deshmande. So I know Pranakar uh, also will be the next round we can have. So Professor Deshmande, I agree with you. know, but uh, what we did in the in the first, what I in the first half was, as I said, descriptive. I was under sure patterns. You know, one should be very careful to think of co causal uh, claims from that. Just patterns, and of course, there are many reasons why we might see the uh, say SC families uh, the mobility not being high or Muslims. There are many reasons, and I don't want to you know speculate too much because. That's a bit dangerous to start speculating when we don't really know the causal, the causal stories here. Culture could be important, of course. Um, I always feel a little bit reluctant to talk about culture because, you know, I'm sorry to say this openly that in the U.S. often, you know, there was argument that blacks do badly because of cultural reasons. I'm always feel uncomfortable with that argument. I don't necessarily think we should rep re replicate that argument in India because that often leads us, you know, this kind of blind alley that oh, then things cannot be changed. And of course, we now know that, lit that literature is deeply flawed in the US. Cultural factors are not the most important reasons why blacks have done worse than, and why, uh, than Caucasians in the US. So here I'd be a little bit careful. I mean, culture might be important, but you know, there, if it is there, it's fine. But there are other things which you can do something about, right? And we should think about what are the things that we can do something about, policy we can do something about that is open to intervention. So, that's my way of looking at the culture and culture question. But I know, you know there may be, of course, very important cultural factors that also explain the results, right? Um, on finally, question eight. So we had only son, the grandson, over 21 years of age. So, you know, so that is very important because otherwise, below 21, we did not introduce any thresholds for the father and the grand grandfather. Grandfather, we could not, right? Um, because that's, you know, grandfathers, you know, that's not really makes no any sense. We didn't put the father because fathers could be a very different age. As 21 years, if you imagine if a son is 21 years, the father hopefully is like 40 plus, you know, and, and then, you know, the grandfather could be of any age. So, so I think uh, that is okay. That in the literature, that's fine. I know we could still do it by specific age cohorts because we have that information. So we could, I couldn't think about that. At this point, we haven't done it by age cohort, but we, we did have a lower threshold for the grandson of 21 years. 
um, but but and that's sort of accepted in the literature. So Madhushri, that's a very interesting question. I mean, the resource capability, exponential, cap I know these are really how to map this into the mobility literature. I mean, the resources would be the endowments, wealth, land, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I mean, both wealth meaning both uh, material or non-material wealth. And uh, capability could be human capital, I suppose. Uh, I have to think about it. I mean, it's a different approach to mobility than what has been in the literature so far. And um, and I think, uh, Tina, I think we are, you know, the literature itself is evolving quite a bit. And we have moved away so much from the Baker terms model that uh, that we are looking at so many different other things, like, I guess, a neighborhood effect and so on. And I said the work, I think that's in Rajchetti's work has been very important, actually. I hope any of you have, who haven't heard of Rajchetti, you must go look up his amazing Data web uh, website is where he produces some of his information on mobility in the US. Amazing uh, inference because he's made us think outside the box, you know, this culture, neighborhood effects, things. So I hope that the literature can move in more in that direction. And we can have a kind of a model of mobility that brings in this all these other things. But that hasn't, that is not that, it's not like that yet. Okay. Right. Um, and uh, uh, an age, I think, I answered. So, color on IHDS, you know, the uh, 2011, 12 round, the second round. Uh, the third round, I believe, it's uh, on, on its way very soon. And we have both the urban. The urban sample is pretty good. They have a large urban sample. Urban uh, in the second part, part of the lecture, I only use the rural sample because we're looking at village data. But in the in the other paper, the first part was both urban and rural. And there again, we found difference between urban and rural mobility also, right? Uh, like we find that we see more educational mobility in rural areas than urban areas because of the huge expansion of schooling in rural areas. We find less mobility than urban areas, which is intuitively positive, right? So then again, that's interesting. Um, mixed marriages, well, that's a bit complicated. I think, um, let's think about that. Um, for the land dominant story, does it really matter? Um, because, you know, we are looking at how a particular village, who owns the most land? Right, of course, you use a head of the house's caste there. So, but normally in the village, if you think about social structure, it's very clear who owns the most land. And it doesn't, wouldn't matter too much whether there are some families or households which have mixed marriages, the overall story of who owns the most land, right? So hopefully that, uh, but I think it's a tricky one. I still don't think, I can check the data. I don't think there's too many examples of mixed marriages in rural areas. Yeah, so maybe for rural areas, we are pretty okay. But that's an interesting question, actually. We can look at that because I think they do ask, I have to check. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if they ask the religion of the spouse in the questionnaire. I don't know. Yeah, they don't have that. Yeah, yeah, so I just can't know much about this, but this is an interesting question whether mixed marriages, even the question of mobility also, is it different, right? Uh, think that will be very interesting. So yeah, uh, on the, I totally agree on the state level stories. So maybe because the one good thing with IHG is district level aggregation is flawed, as I was saying. The state level they have samples at the state level. It's basically an SS sampling strategy. So state level I can construct mobility estimates, and then compare across uh, different states. And I would agree with you. I do think there will be differences between say Tamil Nadu versus Bihar versus Uttar Pradesh. You know, so that's an interesting question that do we see those differences? And so very good point. I'll, I'll, I'll look at the data again on this. Thanks. I think, and then Indrajit, yeah. So Indrajit, that's a fascinating question. You know, we've been thinking about this. Why is it that in India, we've seen educational progress among especially the socially disadvantaged groups, but not met by occupational mobility? That's a really paradoxical question, right? Imagine that, you know, we have increasingly that it's, who are educated up to high level, maybe second, high secondary, and so on. But they are where they're going in the job ladder is pretty much stuck very much where their fathers or the grandfathers were. And there, you know, again, this is speculation, but I think discrimination may still play an important part. We have good experimental studies that there's a very nice study I, I remember that I saw in Chennai where there was this, you know, this very famous kind of approach. You send CVs to job employers and the CV names reflect different caste groups, and they find clear evidence that if the CV reflects different social groups, different groups, the more like less likely to be called for interview. So discrimination, you know, is pretty still strong, as we know also in other parts of the world. So I don't think it's the only reason, but so you know, you might be educated, but you might not get a job because of your 
social background, right? And in the rural part of India, of course, those are definitely going to be more important. Uh, I mean, I'm sure people here know much more about village India, the how much still in village India, if you're agricultural laborer, uh, your father's agricultural laborer, how unlikely it is that you can actually do something else, right? So because of the caste system. So I think that's a really interesting question that we need to really come to grips with. You know, that why is it that we are not progressing on occupation? Now, occupation, you know, is linked to income, right? And uh, because if you have a, if you're a doctor, obviously by definition, you're going to be wealthier than if you're an agricultural laborer when there's progress after the education. So that's a really fascinating uh, puzzle that I don't think we have resolved. Um, on rankings, so, so in DTPU, sociological literature, there's a lot of literature on occupation by sociologists. In fact, the work on occupational mobility is pretty much on sociologists. So I use, use a social, a sociology literature, but we did a check on the income rankings and it pretty much follow the occupational rankings. Yeah, the farmer group is a bit tricky because you have such a wide variation in land ownership among farmers. So we did play around with keeping farmers at a lower level, but we didn't see much difference in the results. So the farmer group is a bit tricky, but the rest of the groups are fairly clearly ordered, right? Professionals, clerical workers, special education, agricultural laborers. And then uh, downward mobility, we do have some estimates of downward mobility. Um, I didn't really talk about that. So, but that's an interesting question by itself. So, you know, upward mobility, downward mobility are really different. But I think the this issue about, you know, how do we think about this thing, the question of monotonicity, that's really interesting because in the literature, I think there's a bias to looking at upward mobility because that's what we think about in the West, you know, people moving out. But as we saw in India, that is not always the case. So there is an argument to look at both directions and maybe there are different reasons for this, the movement downwards versus moving upwards. Let me stop here. I think I'm pretty much done. I think we'll begin with the person after me. And I'll come back to. It was a very eloquent and insightful lecture. I enjoyed uh, uh, listening to you. Uh, I have a few, just a few comments. See, the important question is why occupational mobility is lagging behind educational opportunities, the mobility. My own observation is that there has not been enough emphasis on quality of education. In fact, uh, it is at all level, almost all levels, right from primary level to the university level, it is, there are several obstacles in uh, improving the quality of education. Uh, in fact, as a result of it, you see, you find that uh, several, uh, I read in a newspaper that uh, many in engineering graduates are uh, in jobs like bus conductors and so on. They are not able to move into the occupations for which they are fit. So this is one uh, important fact. The another question is, you see, the, uh, even if the, uh, this problem is not there, you see, there is a lot of government uh, reluctance on the part of the government to recruit at the higher levels. The, the emphasis is on expansion of jobs at the lower level, you see, under Mahatma Gandhi uh, employment guarantee Yojana and such things, you see. And even at that level, you see, the, empl uh, the emphasis on irregular employment, casual employment. The thousands of sanitary workers are, they are, they are working for 40 years. They are not regularized. So this has been, see, the government is not, in fact, there are, thousands of vacancies of uh, at the teachers level, judges, almost in every department there are vacancies, but they are not filling it. See, this is, uh, the government is extremely conservative about uh, filling uh, the about recruitment. I, I think even in uh, universities, I think there is a problem if the government is not encouraging recruitment, you see. It is hindering, it's an obstacle. I, I have this experience when I was in Gulbarga, See, this kind of an opportunity, see, this lack of opportunity is hindering social progress. My third observation is about, I think the gender perspective is not emphasized in your uh, lecture, you see. Now, so does it, uh, have you included both sons and daughters, daughters in this, or only sons, only sons? Uh, there are no data about daughters. Because there's no question about the mother. Hmm? Mother's not a British occupation. No, mother's, no, 
I think relevant to ask you see what was mother or no, no, grandmother's no. occupation whether there has been a progress in the case of our daughter. The question is not there. Yeah. Sure. That's the question. Okay. And uh, the, the one more thing is you see the the observe the finding that there is negative educational and occupation mobility among Muslims. This is a very surprising finding. I can understand if you say that there has not been very significant mobility, but to say it is negative, I think it is a negative counter. Counter. It looks like counterfactual. Very, very uh, my my own observation goes against this kind of. Uh, I mean, I'm 83 now, and I have been observing society for a long time uh, in different situations. And my own observation is that this is this is counterfactual. Uh, probably your data are are you have to be properly scrutinized. Can I? Maybe it's possible. Let me answer your third question. It was not absolute mobility. The mobility of the negative is not absolute mobility. Absolute is when you say that the son is, you know, say your father is illiterate, son is family, family education, right? So that's absolute mobility. I'm comparing Muslims and other groups with upper caste, think compared to them, there's been negative, not negative in the absolute sense, in uh, the relative sense. Relative. Relative sense. Relative. Yeah, of course, absolute mobility has happened. We already saw that. And that's happened across all groups. But we're talking about relative mobility. I that's think important it is important because, to emphasize yeah, that no, point. Yeah, maybe you're right. I should just mention so How mobility, mobility is measured. Is, uh, yeah. And there's, you know, there is both are, con both are used in the literature, absolute mobility and negative and relative mobility. But it's very difficult to be comparing across groups, right? And the other point about the uh, gender, I, I, you know, it's just that, uh, so I hope that IGS3, I have no notes about the question is like, they have a question on mothers, because maybe, you know, in the past it was not so relevant, but now it's not very relevant, right? So let's hope that we exactly have that question in the survey. But I'm very interested in, in, in mother daughter mobility, because I do think that's a really important question what's happening on, on that side. So that's just because we don't have that. Maybe I also also answer the other question now. Was the way? Yeah, yeah. So quality education activity. So you know, imagine that two children, uh, both primary educated, one from a private school in Bangalore, and other from a small little village school uh, in rural Karnataka. Both may be primary or even secondary educated, but they will be very different quality of school in there, right? So that we cannot capture because we're looking at educational categories. But definitely, we should. You know, one can try to. Uh, I mean, I don't know whether it's possible or not, because I don't think we have data going back in time, but that's an important consideration, that why maybe addiction mobility is not in this occupation mobility, right, because of this, of this trend. And on public employment, I think it's a very good point. I do think that one reason why they're not seeing occupation, occupation mobility, especially for disadvantaged groups, is because the government is shrinking its size. Because for many of them, the public sector was the first opportunity to get a job, as you said, clerical work or teacher and so on. The government has been shrinking in size pretty much everywhere. Uh, if you look at the data on government uh, side in India, it's gone down quite substantially about the sector uh, employment. So there is, I think, a very important point that that might be another factor why it's constraining mobility, especially from the social disadvantaged groups. So I completely agree with you on that. So yeah. One portion, um, just uh, you are uh, finding that about Muslims, is likely to be misquoted and used against uh, uh, anti propaganda. Against, uh, <laughs> I'm a researcher, you know. No, no, I'm, I'm, if it is factual, it is okay. Mm. If you are, it is, you emphasize that it's relative, mm. not uh, yeah. absolute. Yeah. And it is likely to be mistaken as absolute. Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure. That I, yeah. yeah, thank you. And uh, now I'll just go back to Bala. Um, you still have a question, Bala? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, I got already answer from. Some, okay, uh, then uh, shall, we, shall I move on to the other one? Yeah. Uh, so, you, uh, only uh, one thing is there, sir. Uh, as we know very well, uh, last 75 years, uh, you know, there is a number of uh, development programs is coming and going in, in our countries. Uh, uh, based on your uh, actually the first part of uh, uh, presentation, you said uh, occupational mobility associated with the federal caste. Um, there is no any positive impact if it comes to the uh, second part of your presentation regarding the educational mobility uh, associated with the federal system. That is a positive thing, sir. So, uh, what I think actually the educated federal caste uh, people they are not getting job. 
it's clearly showing that thing still uh, you, you already given answer there is some discrimination is there there is some inequality there but how to reduce all the thing you know because we are talking since last 20 years but it's where is the problem whether it's an institutional problem or implementation problem so these are the, some general issues there so okay. uh, this is Thank my you. actually so we will take some more yeah, yeah. Anil? Uh, thank you, Professor Sen, for an extremely insightful lecture. I'm uh, much educated by your lecture. I just want to say one thing that uh, when you said, is India a land of opportunity? Uh, I, I thought of different kind of uh, lecture that is it a land of opportunity for capital or for labor? Uh, but I got a different lecture altogether. Uh, 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 it's a land of opportunity for capital, of course. Uh, but that besides, my point is something different. The point is this, that when you are measuring occupational change, uh, uh, social mobility for, for the matter, you're only looking at education. And okay. education as a means of social mobility has its own limitations. And occupation. And opportunity. And education as a means of social mobility has limitations because by itself, education can only enable people to uh, get occupations. But occupations themselves have to be created in the first place. And that's possible only when there is structural change. That is when there is industry. We are talking here of a static situation, more or less static situation over a long period of time, because there is no development of industry and no, industry, no industrial jobs. So we have we see that there is social mobility in terms of education, but there is no occupational mobility. Even those who have educated education do not have jobs because there is no there is no development of proper manufacture or secondary sector in that sense of the term. So there is a limitation in your lecture. What I'm trying to say, I'm not criticizing, but what, what I'm trying to say is that your assumption that it's only agriculture sector. Sectoral assumption, point one. Occupational assumption that there is no industry. Uh, these are two assumptions are problematic for the lecture. And, and finally, uh, the, the, the situation may be different if you take industrial, most industrial states. There's a situation obtained same for Punjab, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, and Bihar in UP, it doesn't. In, 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 in states where, where industry has progressed better, you are likely to have more jobs and therefore educational mobility can translate into occupational mobility. But where there is a stagnant agricultural, more or less stagnant economy, the possibility, even when you provide education, it will only lead to migration, but not occupational mobility. So I stop here with this observation. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Gitu, there is also one more Gitu. So two, how come two are there? <laughs> okay, you are uh, you are the one with us. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, sir, for the opportunity. I have two thoughts. First is in consonance with what we were all talking about. I was just relating to what's happening in my place. Mm -hmm. So people like me got opportunity to study in ICAC schools and others. But all, all, although all almost all children in my place have access to education, uh, we got opportunity to come out of the state and has good communication skills. So when it comes to the employment opportunities, there is a quite a difference. So it isn't consensus with the paradox. And also, uh, if for the past few years, there is another trend that is happening in our place, that is students migrate to Canada or USA or to abroad just after their 12th. So they are, despite their income, despite their background, so uh, they are ready to take risk. They are ready to take loans, and then they migrate. So I, I feel this occupational hierarchy might differ. And my second thought was, when we talk about moving ahead in this occupation uh, and talking about policy interventions, uh, so do we, don't we need farmers and carpenters in the future as well? So is it moving up the occupational mobility, the ultimate solution to achieve a good standard of living or other development in this? Is? Thank you, sir. And the last one in this round. I'm glad. I mean, the previous two speakers have cleared the ground. I mean, the, the linear link you presume between opportunities and social mobility, I think, has to be uh, uncoupled 
because we can seek ask for opportunities to stay where we are quote unquote there is no staying where we are in a you know in a static sense but to continue to do what we have done but continue to get a certain you know access to things that make you feel you feel you fulfill life you know the the example of the the agriculture laborers across generations can be seen as a pessimistic fact the way you offered it or it can be an optimistic fact if the same agricultural laborer is being valued for his agricultural skills right now there is definitely to be too many and easily disposed and they seem like you guys better think of something else to do but if you have an organic farm tomorrow in that village that has capital scientists but agricultural laborers then the whole thing changes so i think this model has to be opened up a little bit uh, to allow for cultural questions because i don't think blaming the victim is exhaust the culture question I think it opens up a whole host of other things. Um, yes, including education, sir. I think it's the most uh, a cultural thing here. But our educational model is industrial modernity. It's a ticket to living in a city, and we have lived with it for two hundred years. That has to be pluralized. Someone can go to the classroom and come out feeling I can also do agriculture if I want to. But there's nothing in the current system that will encourage them in that thought. So there are all these things that I. So there are two, three more. Uh, I think maybe you would like to answer on that. Yeah, yeah uh, sure. So, so sure, one sure. footnote. Sorry, before I forget, you know, I heard Michael Sandel recently say that this idea of higher education for all and then opportunities for all is in, is collapsed in America. He's saying now we need to create opportunities locally, which doesn't depend on someone having higher education because the fee has become expensive, unaffordable, etc., etc. So he thinks, uh, and I think. Sure, sure. This is very quite provocative, actually. So, by the way, Chandan, um, you know, one thing to keep in mind. I mean, just going what Michael Sandel said. If you look at the U.S., if you don't have college education versus if you have college education, your life chances are absolutely different. Your real wages in for non-college education is just stagnated, declined actually the last twenty, thirty years in the U.S. While real wages of college educated has just gone up, gone to the roof. So I'm not completely convinced that not being college educated, and that might apply to India also, is something that you want to think as a possibility, right? Uh, because why is that happened? Because skills are so important in the modern economy, and of course, if you're college education, you have the skills to get jobs in, you know, which are higher paying. Versus if you're non college educated, you're essentially stuck as production workers in a factory or something like that. So. And that's, I think the same argument may also apply in India. I do agree with you that one should not necessarily see higher education as the end point for everything. But given the fact that education is so now complementary to the skills that we need in our modern labor market, and India is moving in that direction, right, with automation and technology and so on, it's a bit, you know, I mean, maybe it works with few individuals, but on the whole. I don't necessarily think that's a model we can encourage. That we don't want to have education being a, you know, and not not necessarily education. That's the point that Gita made. That you know, I'm I think that the movement to vocational education. So you know, there are many stories in the West. Like, you know, father could be a doctor, and the son or the daughter wants to be something else, right? That's quite natural in the West. I'm sure in India you can also imagine. In India, there is this problem that if your father's doctor, you have to be somewhere near that level. But you know, why not, right? So vocational skills are very well encouraged nowadays in the modern labor market, but of course, the level down, agricultural labor. I should also say it's not only agricultural labor, construction workers. The two big categories in that in that last category, the big groups, are construction workers in the cities, agricultural laborers in the in the rural areas. Right. Um, so that's the where we would want to not have movement down, and we see a lot of that happening. So vocational uh, occupations, again, I would say. Not the caste-based vocational occupations, because there's a stigma still associated with those caste-based vocational occupations. So maybe that will change. I don't know. So the more technical vocational occupations, I don't see a problem if you movement in that in that up and down around that those categories. So just to answer that question, I think it's the last category which I think I personally feel that you know it's not because we know if you look at the average uh, earnings of. Agricultural workers, or construction workers, and the data is far less than anything any of the other occupations, right? So that's something to keep in mind. So Anil, I totally agree, structural change, right? But remember, I'm looking at we're looking at relative mobility, 
So imagine that there's only a few amount number of jobs in the cities in manufacturing and modern services. Who gets this job? Right? Now, if it is the case that the two individuals that want to try to get the job and the person who gets the job is of a particular social group controlling for everything else, then there is a problem here, right? So of course there are limited jobs in the city. In, in India, if there was more jobs, this is why China is interesting counterexample. In China, we do see more mobility, right? In China, there's been a lot of jobs created in manufacturing modern services. So we are trying to say that controlling for the amount of jobs, which as you said, has been changing over time in India, and there hasn't been that much creation of jobs in manufacturing and modern services, who gets those kind of jobs? And if it is the case, it's going to, if there's a sort of bias in some direction, right, controlling for everything else, then there is a concern that why is that happening, right? So um, uh, so it's important to keep in mind that we're talking about relative mobility. Because absolute mobility, I totally agree with you on that point. But relative mobility is a different story, right? So now I think solutions- so, Anil, that, uh, you can talk later, uh, okay. Yeah, no, <laughs> there are several of uh, yeah. several people in the queue, okay. So I think Bala, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't have a solution because I'm always reluctant to offer solutions, you know, with this, uh, where is, but I think the thing is that on the second part of my lecture, there was a quite clear difference across villages and infrastructure. And, uh, and it's interesting that, why do we see that? Because we always think about equalization across villages because of the Panchayatira system and so on. So that was surprising. And that might explain why we're seeing difference in mobility patterns depending on which particular social group dominates the village. So there may be a solution there, I, I don't know. But there's a bigger question, I think, that this is perhaps even Professor Madhesh and others work on this area can say that in India, we've had affirmative action programs, right, uh, for a long time. How much that has had an effect, it's not obvious, right? Because you would have thought that these programs might have done something to mobility. Um, again, I'll be very careful. I'm not trying to draw causal links here. But it's a question that what has it really delivered in that sense, right? So these are things we need to think about a bit more in India. And I would say I'm not the person to give the solution here. But I think this is uh, just our work is speaking to that kind of debate. And I think that's important to have that in a debate. I'm not saying we should roll back affirmative action programs. We should think about how we can make them more effective. Perhaps that's that's not been been the case so far. Right? Thanks. Yeah, we'll just uh, no. We will come. We, yeah, I will give you opportunity afterwards. Okay, we can. So we have three more. Uh, this thing, Machang, Abhimanyu, and then uh, one iPhone, which is still it is there. Uh, <laughs> so, and uh, Machang, you please. In the meanwhile, if any one of you want to ask questions, not the ones we have already asked. So you can just. Uh, there is one. Uh, okay, sure. Uh, two. Go ahead. Thank three, you. Four. Okay, good. Thank you. In fact. Yes, I waited for longer. I mean, the longer I waited, the more the more similar questions have been raised, and each answer has been answered. But still, then I still have uh, a couple of things which I think it may relate to what we have spoken on, particularly on this occupational education mobility, something like that, and social mobility. Now, <clears throat> one is yes, much has been discussed on this occupational mobility, and uh, I think well, one aspect which uh, is not coming up from the discussion is about the structural change in the population, for example, uh, the household size change and the family size change. I think that matters uh, a lot, that determines a lot in uh, changing the occupational, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what about participation. For example, uh, we all know that uh, in uh, among the Hindus, we, we have smaller size of families and Muslims have larger, uh, similarly, uh, uh, SE has larger, you know, something like that. You know? So I think structure, uh, structure, I mean, not the structure, the, the size of the household and the family, I think that matters uh, and determines the occupational participation or mob about mobility in particular. I think that may need to be, uh, I mean, looking if, uh, if at all to see the occupational changes, uh, how, we, how may, they may intervene in the social mobility. Because uh, we, know, we all know that uh, India's um, uh, structure of employment, that uh, mostly concentrated on the unorganized sector. You know, we don't have much. Um, about ten percent of the total employment is on the organized sector, which everybody, particularly the educated, vying for. You know, that means. So I think uh, combining these two aspects, what educational changes brought over the period of time, and employment 
uh, structure and the population, uh, uh, sorry, family size. You know, I think that may need to uh, that may uh, help in explaining the uh, certain employment mobility, uh, sorry, occupational mobility, and that eventually affect the social mobility. And and uh, second thing which I I miss uh, in this uh, uh, discussion is I was expecting that it may come up that we were talking about occupational mobility. I, social mobility. I think certain uh, 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 the economic mobility, income mobility. I think that needs to be bring in because uh, when we talk about occupational mobility, uh, income mobility definitely comes into play and determines the changes in the occupations and their aspirations uh, as well as their um, social mobility. You know? uh, I think that needs to be a certain. Uh, and lastly, uh, lastly, uh, as uh, Dr. Neil has also written, I, think I was also expecting, you know. That what are the opportunities which you wanted to identify uh, apart from what two types of employment and education which you mentioned opportunities opportunities which uh, uh, you wanted to emphasize in your paper I mean like I uh, East India a land of opportunity I mean that is a big question so what are the opportunities is it employment opportunities or education opportunities or what type of opportunities in detail Thank you Thank you and then everyone new can you please unmute uh, with uh, Satish, our new one. Yeah, everyone, you please be, be brief and then uh, ask for question. Thank you, Professor Rajshet. Thank you, Professor Sen. Uh, it was really interesting. Alvan, uh, your uh, audio is uh, not stable. Can you just uh, do something? No, ask him to remove the mask. Yeah, See. remove the remove mask and then speak. Yes, sir. I'm asking now. Yeah, it's okay. Now, please speak. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my first point is regarding migration. What is the role played by migration in the context of social mobility? That's my uh, because and is it reflected in case IHDS uh, data provides data on migration? Is it is dependent with differential pattern that we have seen with regard to mobility? Also, is it reflected in migration? That's my first point. And the second is, uh, as I see it, it's ultimately whether it's the enclave effect or whether it's the proximity advantage. It's all about how accessibility, access to public goods and private environment they interact to and basically they determine social mobility. So uh, in this sense, I do not quite get the conclusion part of the alternative uh, mode of action because ultimately these two are the uh, determinants which have been uh, focused. Right? Thank you. Okay. Uh, iPhone. <laughs> I don't know. Either. Yeah, Professor. Uh, professor. Uh, yeah. I phone myself, Professor Krishna Raja, traveling back okay. to Bangalore. <laughs> <laughs> so nice to know that. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you, go ahead. Uh, Professor Kunal Sen. It was uh, Professor Kunal Sen. It was uh, really very thought-provoking uh, lecture, and uh, uh, I really enjoyed. But see, even though I could not hear you properly because of internet, uh, sometimes it was barking. Uh, uh, my question is that, uh, see, uh, India is also transiting. Uh, it means that India, if you take macro economy, it is also transiting uh, uh, from uh, agriculture to uh, directly service sector. So uh, you, you are talking about the social mobility of different communities. Is there any relationship between this uh, mobility? Can you relate this story to the macro level picture? Because uh, uh, ultimately, it translates into poor income and uh, uh, the uh, income inequality uh, already we are facing. So the degree of mobility is more important here. The degree of mobility here in the sense that uh, some rich people, say, for example, uh, already there are a good number of uh, peace uh, work, uh, uh, Thomas Piketty, uh, Stiglitz, and others have already worked on. So the degree of mobility among rich is much, much higher than the, the degree of mobility among the poor. So, so is there any impact of this type of uh, uh, educational and occupational mobility on income mobility that uh, results in income inequality? So that uh, uh, will further uh, affected by the, uh, that will be further affected by the inflation. So this, even though there is a short term mobility, but uh, it may be uh, long term mobility is a big problem because of uh, occupational and educational, even unemployment situation and uh, uh, occupational problems because there is no employment opportunities and other things. 
so can you relate this one uh, your uh, uh, findings with the national uh, economy mobility i'll stop here thank you thank, thank you very much uh, now we have three questions and one on uh, chat box and then uh, i think four of them together we can answer this is from jayat uh, shinde <laughs> then four more <laughs> all right so um so you know when the point so let me first say i, I did not present the full regression results for my the first paper because that would have taken a lot of time. So we control for household size and we control for demographic age and so on. So in the, in the, in the regressions, when we look at mobility across generations, the double difference model, we have a whole bunch of covariates there. So we net because you know, household size is obviously important across social groups also, right? So some groups, social groups have largest family size and so on. So there we control for everything. Um, hope that answers your question. That's as, you know, so as good as we can do this. So totally net out all the society. And so in the in that paper, which is all open access, by the way, so you can take a look at it, we have a whole bunch of controls that are just hopefully taking over all these things. Um, on income mobility, you know, that's what, whenever we present this work with where some economists are present, I don't think you're an economist. You're an economist. Okay, that's uh, uh, because they're always like, why not income mobility? We don't want to, you know, education, more occupation. Is... Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, I think that's a good point. I mean, I think that was also been mentioned by Professor Kishan Raj, right? That, uh, that, you know, we should look at income mobility. Um, and there is a way to do that. They haven't done it yet because before the IHT, there was a 1993-94 survey done. It was uh, same households that the NCR did. And we, there they have income data. So we are thinking whether we should explore that and then do our income mobility. I think because most of the work in the in the West is on income mobility, right? And of course, as you said, ultimately we want to know what income, not so much occupational education. So, but you know, this is the thing we are want to do it, but we also worried about measurement issues. And as you know, you know, measurement errors can be quite large income measurement. But you're right, maybe we should be pushed into income mobility and just accept that that the measurement error will have to be dealt with economic trigger or some other. Sorry? Yeah, that is also true. Yeah, exactly. That's true. Yeah, that's a good point. We don't have income by, by individual level data in, in the IHDS. So, but, you know, I think it's worth thinking how we can do Maybe there's some other data sets. I was told PLFS has some mobile panels and some, um, you know, I mean, they may have some retrospective question with parents and so on. I'm not sure. I haven't checked PLFS. I know something works on PLFS, but we should think about income mobility also, because that's a really important question. Um, what sort of opportunity that goes back to what uh, uh, Krishna was asking that, you know, like what are, what is the vision for society in India, right? What, what do we want the society to be, right? And I think ultimately also one thing we need want the society to be is what I said at the beginning, equal opportunity, right? That is a fundamental prerequisite of any good society, right? So that is a, is a non-negotiable point, right? But then beyond that, what do we want? Do we want a society full of only doctors and engineers and, and, and lawyers? Is that what we want? Not necessarily, I agree, right? So what is it that we want to see that, that would you know, be something that meets the criteria of equal opportunity to everyone, net independent of income and so on, but also what kind of society is seen as a society which is dynamic and economically prosperous and so on, uh, but also socially just. That's not an easy question because China has shown quite, compared to India, China has shown more mobility. If we compare data, you can see that. But China is also highly unequal as a society. So I don't know, which, you know how we would, so if you look at, okay, that, let me add this point. In the work that we have seen in rich countries, the Western countries, three countries do very well. And I mean, I live in one of them. Finland, Sweden, and Norway, and Denmark, or four, do much better on social mobility measures, any kind, education, income, compared to the US, UK, France, Germany, and so on. Now, 
there is a reason for that. It's not coincidental, right? Because they really invested in universal education. They really made sure there was no discrimination. I mean, of course, the social homogeneous populations. So in the West, we know there are some models of social mobility and social just justice. So why can't India be like one of those countries? That's the question we should ask, right? At some point, not right now, at some point, isn't it? So I think that's important. Okay, migration, we have taken into account migration. I think of, you know, by including the non-resident uh, siblings or ch children. So that's one thing I think the IHF gave, gave us. Now, uh, so in that sense, I think if that's the question asking that what about those who left the household, we do have that information in, in the IHGS. And, uh, and I didn't get the public goods, private sector thing, but I think what you're saying is that we need to think a bit more about the proximity advantage and enclave effect. And I totally agree because we are still doing more work on that. So hopefully next time I, I come around and present this work, I'll have more results to share in that. We haven't done that yet. Uh, I think I should stop because that's pretty much that covers sure, the sure. Yes. And we already and then there are the... four uh, students. Uh, uh, we'll just listen to them uh, very quickly. And then Subendu, Minakshi, uh, Jyoti, and uh, Vijaya. Okay, Subendu, can you be. Uh, okay. Sorry? Why don't you come and speak to the mic? Yeah, you can come here. You can come here. And these are the last four questions, sir. No more. Uh -huh. So my question is on the generation two, especially you have mentioned that uh, non-resident that is out. But what if the person, especially those who are living in our generation two, but they have the history of migration? Because uh, if we see the migration that uh, because of the income, I mean, that can uh, that can increase their income level or maybe resource uh, they have the influences over their resources so and their children might get a better opportunity compared to uh, other those who don't have migration history especially in the generation two so so my question is on it like whether you have classification uh, there is a different classification for those generation two or not <clears throat> Like Anil sir, I was also allured by the title of the topic itself, Is India a Land of Opportunity? Because I thought that I'll be getting uh, sufficient justification from this lecture uh, and I would be able to justify my husband who always and every day says me that there is no opportunity in India, in India and India is a land of no opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, nevertheless, uh, it was an enriching and insightful uh, lesson. I learned a lot. Sir, uh, in this respect, uh, I have one point to make and one question to raise. Coming to one point, so one of your findings says that there is an increase in the mobility, educational mobility, but that educational mobility has not been rightly transmitted to the occupational mobility. So what could be the possible reasons behind it? So what I feel is that, uh, as was rightly mentioned by Nadsani, sir, there is a lack of quality education. Now, what I feel is that, Sir, we are producing, our universities and institutions are producing educated people, but not employable. That education is not being transmitted properly to the uh, to create employability. So there is one point. Uh, and for this, what we need is that there is there is a need of 360 degree revamp of the structural system of a structural educational system. Now coming to the second part, there is a uh, mismatch between demand and supply. What our industries are demanding, what skill sets our industries are demanding that is not been rightly provided by the educational institutions. So uh, there is a need, uh, need of the hour is there should be an industry and academia collaboration for that. So these are two points with respect to your first finding. Now coming to my question, sir, uh, you said that uh, your result says that um, with increase in mobile, uh, educational mobility, there is no increase in occupational mobility. Now, sir, have you and you have uh, used IHDS data set, and it is uh, the data set is corresponding to uh, household level. So, have you found any households or a cohort of households wherein this particular result is not coming? And if yes, what are the different characteristics of that household which makes them stand apart with respect to your conclusion? Thank you so much. Okay. So first of all, let me express my pleasure to towards Isaac. Let we got a chance to hear you personally here. I have attended various uh, webinar you were speaking, but I never knew that you will be here and I will get a chance to hear you in, in person. 
uh, the question I would like to raise, like a little bit, I got answered. Uh, you were answering the other question, like, is India a land of opportunity? But we are, uh, you know, going. Uh, your paper is going to rural area to search for the answer. But we know that uh, there are no opportunity in rural area. Opportunities are created in uh, urban area because there is. We know there is a big gap between India and Bharat. So although when you factor in the migration, like you say, generation three will be maybe in uh, urban area, but you have factor in that. So is it, I was wondering, is it the story or uh, the picture of rural area we are uh, talking about here? So is it like that or is it, uh, if we translate it into urban, same story will be repeated. So that is what I'm wondering. Uh, Opportunity, sir, my uh, question is that you have begun with an interesting question, but I was searching for at least a plausible answer, even in the concluding remarks, uh, 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 the presentation ends with, uh, we need to invest uh, more in uh, social mobility and uh, growth with social justice. But if I, uh, uh, if I try to contextualize the question, the central question asked and the uh, plausible answers are concluding remarks uh, drawn, uh, I feel uh, it's not strongly matching out because the growth with social justice is more of a development pattern or development path that India has been taking. But the question raised is a different path. So what I feel is that the, uh, the dynamics and the diversity of social mobility, uh, which was tried to uh, bring out is uh, uh, by and large uh, confined to a, uh, 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 or conceives India as a uh, homogeneous entity, uh, that the diversification, within the social mobility patterns are by and large missing. Even though the graphs do explain to an extent, but I feel the central question and the concluding remarks are not strongly matching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So please. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I question that I got from Jairat, which is kind of a very good question, I have to say. And uh, um, so let me just read the question. It's linked to the question that came on with which occupation. The question that came from, from Jairat, who I don't know still there. He's there. He's there. With respect to the first finding linked to education occupation mobility, it implies that education mobility is not leading to occupation mobility, which is also what you asked. But is it possible that education leading to high earnings is simultaneously possible, along with non occupation mobility, to allowing for Becker's model to hold? So, some, so this is a really good question and linked to a very specific uh, mm. the model itself. I agree, Jaira, that's very possible. And that's a very good point. I mean, it's possible that education mobility is leading to income mobility. But not at the occupation mobility, though it has to under very strict assumption that's only possible. And so the Becker model can still hold. So I agree. I mean, I think that's a good thing to say. I think there's a good caveat that you brought in here that because we're not estimating the Becker type model, which is income mobility, um, and therefore we should not necessarily say that it's possible that Becker, the Beckerian hypothesis still holds education leads to income mobility, education mobility is great. And uh, without working on occupation mobility, perfectly valid. Excellent question. Thank you. So that's a, I need to keep that caveat in mind. And this is very present in our where economists are actually are looking at the assumptions and making sure you are actually not trying to say something that's not linked to the assumption of the Becker model. Sorry. Exactly. So that's a really good point. And uh, so again, excellent question. I'm sorry I didn't get your name. Uh, it was a very good question. Really liked it. And again, I'd like to see this because, you know, obviously you've been listening to the lecture and really getting the heart of the issue, right? The generation two, we did not track generation two, uh, those who have uh, the left were not in the household. And, he, and we also didn't track the siblings of the head in that household, right? And those who are not in that household, of course, by data limitation, we cannot, because you don't know where they are, right? We only know the head of the household, right? And maybe there's a tedious matching we could have done by looking for other households, but that would be really, I don't think that's possible in Asia, right? Because they don't name the, they can, they tell you that siblings are not there, but they don't say which household they are in, right? So I don't know if that's possible, but that's a selection effect bias, right? So very good point. And that both those two groups, the non-resident siblings of the head and the resident siblings, we are not tracking. So very, very, I mean, totally agree with that. Um, on the so on the education occupation mobility, that's something you want to do more work. So we haven't got an answer to your question. What is explaining this lack of 
and there may be differences across different groups, as you said, and so on. That's something we need to look at more. So, as I said, that maybe somebody here can do a thesis on this or uh, do some more work on this, because this is something that perhaps might be of interest to many of you, right? Um, maybe not even IHT, as there are other data sets that one can also look at, right? But I think that's a really interesting issue of how exactly when does education mobility lead to occupation mobility and when, when does it not? Right, so I think that's uh, that's an open question. I don't have an answer to that. Urban, actually, the first paper, the one that I presented at the beginning, it's got the urban and the uh, rural sample. So it's got it's got the whole sample, right? First one, the ones that we've been covering by papers. You can take a look at it. So it's got the whole urban and the rural. And we do find we do an urban rural split. And as I was saying, we don't find we find education mobility in rural areas compared to urban areas, but the reverse occupation mobility, right? So there we have the whole sample. And IHDS is pretty good urban sample. The problem with IHDS is, again, for those who are here to thinking about these dissertations, is that their urban sample doesn't have this kind of questions they have the village rural sample. In rural sample, they did this village questionnaire, which is very, very, very rich. So we looked at special, the castes, groups, and land ownership, and many things. So there we don't have something similar for the urban sample. Otherwise, I would have done exactly as you said, looked at mobility issues for the urban sample, but we can't. Again, are there other data sets? I'm not sure, you know? I mean, there has been some work by Sam Asher and uh, Paul Novoshat using the census data for educational mobility, Asher and Novoshat. So they may be, you know, but I think that I still feel the IHDS is still uh, a good place to start with because of this retrospective questions I have on parental occupation education. So yeah, I hope that answered that question. Um, I think that's it really. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, uh, <laughs> Anil wants to engage. Yeah, quickly, you. very quickly. I think the uh, connect between educational mobility and occupational mobility is like this. The probability of occupational mobility is more when there is industry and manufacture. And when the country does not become back office of uh, the uh, okay. Silicon Valley. Uh, if you are, if we are hoping to be, uh, become or uh, remain only the service sector back office of Silicon Valley, we are not going to solve this problem of agrarian stagnation, wherein you will find all kinds of discriminations, as Ambedkar rightly points out. So uh, the question is very simple. It's a question of probability of finding jobs. Mm -hmm. And the educated can probably find more occupational mobility in an industrialized sector, industrialized yeah, scenario, than in a stagnant agrarian scenario, where all kinds of discriminations are likely to persist for far longer time than we can imagine. Thank you. I couldn't agree with you more. Okay, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. You summed so, up the situation in India very well, I mean, that's, uh, I think I couldn't agree with you more on this. Absolutely. Uh, it's very well taken point. Yeah. Thank Precisely you. the paradox the Harris Todaro model pointed out that the more employment opportunities cities create, the more migration they encourage and the more unemployment that it leads to. So so you cannot be absolutely sure. And that leads to the pessimism for urban policy in countries like Africa and even India until today. Okay. And that's why we have Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment yeah, Guarantee Program. Yeah. To prevent migration. To prevent yeah, migration. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, I hats off to your patience. Now we have been going on for the last one hour, 20 minutes, uh, the question answer session. Perhaps this would have been the longest session that you have had. <laughs> no, 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 no. But it's a very, very good actually, very good. That is, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I think uh, your, your lectures uh, provoked many people to think and then, uh, so therefore they have been asking questions. What I'm telling you that I, I appreciate you. Because the thing is that uh, even now also there's no tiredness in your voice. You're still uh, would like to go on. Yeah, and yeah, and then there are uh, signals coming from some people that we need to close, and then and so therefore we have to close. But the closing will be done by Abina. Uh, over to you, Abina, for uh, giving thanks. Okay. Thank you, sir. Good evening, all. We have come to an end of uh, ten golden jubilee lecture on Is India a Land of Opportunity by Professor Kunal Chand. So I'm happy to take this opportunity, opportunity to thank you all. So it's my privilege to thank uh, the respected speaker of the day, uh, Professor Kunal Chand, uh, 
Dr. VKR Virao, Chair Professor Isaac and Director, United Nations University World Institute for uh, Development Economics Research, Finland. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. It's really interesting. And uh, thank you. Uh, then I thank Professor Sukhdev Thora, Chairperson, Board of Go Governors, ISEC. We are grateful to Professor D. Ratshega, Director, ISEC, for the welcome address and his constant support throughout the lecture series. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me thank Assistant Professor Dr. Merchant uh, for introducing the speaker to us. Um, uh, thank you, sir. And the organizing committee members for coordinating this program. I wholeheartedly thank all the faculty members, my friends, and other uh, participants who have joined online and off offline today. Thank you all. A sincere thank to the academic session, administrative staff, especially Sadish Kamath sir, and the supporting staff for the, uh, facilitating the smooth functioning of the program. Once again, thank you all. Uh, have a nice evening. Thank you, Abina. Let's give a, a round of applause for this lecture. Good lecture. We have really enjoyed it. <laughs>